Tonight on Life on the Rock, we have Father Jeremiah Miriam Shryock. We'll see a video from Chris Stefanik and much more. Welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight, our guest is Father Jeremiah Miriam Shryock. He's written a book called Amid Passing Things, and he gives a wonderful spir spiritual teaching in there about how the you know, different challenges we face in modernity mm -hmm. and how our faith can help us live in this culture, that this age we find ourselves in. We're now going to a video with Chris Stefanik. Why do Catholics around the world honor Mary so much? When Jesus had given us everything on the cross, he looked down and saw one last gift, his mom. And he told his beloved disciple, behold your mother. And he told his mother, behold your son. Jesus gave us his mother. See, God didn't just save us as individuals, but as a family. And the most highly honored human being in the family of the church, not including Jesus himself, who's God, it isn't some super apostle or great prophet or, or warrior king. It's a mom who lived the hidden heroism that moms so often live, saying yes to life at the Annunciation when she knew it risked her own life and reputation. Yes to life when it required getting up throughout the night to nurse him. Yes to life when it meant standing by him at the foot of the cross. Yes to life when she received him again in the Eucharist. She was mostly unnoticed in life by everybody but God, and now, She's called Ark of the New Covenant, Star of the Sea, Terror of Demons, Help of Christians, Queen of Heaven and Earth. But the most honored title she has is Mother, Mother of God and our Mother. Moms, grandmas, religious sisters who live out your own vocation to motherhood in your own amazing way, that's a glimpse of the glory that God has in store for you. So why do we honor Mary so much? Because she's our mom. And no matter how hard we try, we can't possibly honor her as much as her son did. Father Jeremiah, welcome to Life on the Rock. Thank you, Father Mark. It's good to be here. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed your book, you know, Amid Passing Things. And um, I, I just, I love how it just addresses relevant topics and things we all struggle with. You know, people that have very little faith or people that have been at the religion game for a long time, you know. So how do you, you give retreats and talks, conferences, writing, podcasts, how do you characterize maybe some common struggles in our culture today? Yeah, I think a lot of people today are, they're distracted, um, but they're also very hungry. You know, the world that we live in is, is very noisy and it's very busy. And I think most people realize that, or there's this realization in them that there's more to life than just all of these busy activities. And there's this hunger for this death, which is ultimately a, a hunger for God, right? And I think for modern people, uh, the challenge is getting them to step away, even for even if it's just for a few moments, um, to some sort of, of silence, to some sort of opening their heart uh, to God. Because life passes so quickly, the days go so fast, if we don't do that, we're just going to be continually swept away by all this activity that we find ourselves in. Right, and you, you write beautifully about the present moment, how we find God in the present moment, and even a personal resolution you made to just focus on what you're doing now. Talk about that. Yeah, that's a, that's a challenge. I'm still working on that for sure. <laughs> but I mean, I think, you know, like everyone, you know, being a, a priest, it, there's all kinds of things we can be doing, and there's all kinds of uh, people who are in need. But one thing I've learned just from my own life is that, you know, God is, he's right now. All he's asking me to do right now is whatever it is I'm doing right now. 
And I can best minister to the person I'm with by, by being with them, because that's where God is, right? God is not in our past. He's not in our future. He's here right now with us. And when we, when we can really live in the present moment, I believe and I've experienced, it's just a deeper sense of, of God's presence. Right. You know, somebody sent me a, this decorative saying framed, it just says, enjoy the moment. And when I first saw it, I thought, well, that's kind of our kind of a cultural bromide kind of thing. Yeah. But then it made me think, I said, no, that's our faith teaches us, you know, to be in yeah. that present moment because that's where you find God. And, yeah. and you, you write about listening and like in spiritual direction. And I thought that was a great point you know, as a priest that we want to jump in and give our view of God, our experiences all the time. But just to truly listen to them. And what do you find does for the, the directee or the person you're listening to? Yeah. Well, it's funny you ask that question because right now I'm, I'm literally in the middle of directing uh, an eight day retreat with the Sisters of Life. So I have um, six sisters right now that I'm directing, and it's it's amazing. Just so they're coming to me each day and telling me, talking to me about their previous day as prayer, and I notice that the more I listen to them, the more sort of their own heart and their own minds open up to what God is doing. So like there's there's so many examples where once they start talking, I want to like jump in immediately, whether it's encouraging them or you know, whatever it might be, it might be something good. But I've realized like the more and more I give them space to let them express what God is doing, let them search for their words, it's almost like God is revealing himself in that conversation more deeply than if I just jumped in. And so as, at least for a spiritual director, the tendency is always, or the challenge is always, let them speak, listen first, listen deeply so that God can be heard and then, and then come in. And I guess they can see maybe clearly, more clearly how God's working in their lives or what he's saying to them in the things of their life experiences. Absolutely. You know, I had, a, I had an experience once with a, a director. I was on an eight-day retreat. And this director, I came to him the first day. And I was sharing with him about my prayer and what I perceived was going on. And he literally didn't say anything. And so I just kept talking, and then I paused again, and he didn't say anything, and on and on and on and went. And then, but I knew he was listening, but he wasn't getting in the way. And when I left that meeting, it was, it was an amazing experience because by his listening, I was able to open up more and more and more than I would have if he would have just jumped in and intervened. Now, he did, obviously, towards the end, but he really gave me space to listen to what God was doing in my own heart. And I think that's a, that's a real gift to enable another person to listen to what God is doing in their lives. Yes, and even if it does have to be maybe a, a conversation that has some confrontation or challenge to it, sure. you write about how they could receive that better after being heard. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think, again, it's like if, if, you, if you come at somebody right away, they're going to be on the defensive Right. But if you really listen to them and hear what's going on, they I think they have a sense that they know that you're with them in this. Like even if even if you do have to confront them with the challenging word, it's coming from a place of of love. Right. I think to listen to another person is ultimately to love them. Right. You know, in one of the chapters in the book that I loved, especially loved was the one about that you call her Joan, um, but you met her on a plane. Tell us about that interaction because you were listening to her. Yeah. So, yeah, this was a few years ago. Um, I forget exactly where I was flying. It probably says it in the book. But this, uh, this lady sat down next to me. And I think she was probably in her 40s. Um, and once the plane, uh, well, it was the last empty seat was the one next to me. And I was thinking, wow, I'm going to have an empty seat this whole plane ride. You know, it's kind of a prayer we all pray sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but God had other plans. And so this, this lady sat down and Immediately, she just started talking to me and just sharing with me about her life. And uh, she was just coming back from a, a rehab center for alcohol, uh, alcohol uh, abuse. And she had two young children, two young boys, I believe. And so she had obviously been through a lot. And she was, you know, she was asking very normal questions. I don't know how to be a mom. I don't know uh, what I'm going to do. 
uh, and on and on and on and on and on. And after listening to her for a long time, I remember just, you know, saying to her, like, Joan, like, think about this. Like, right now, we're 30,000 feet up in the air, right? You just, you just were very courageous by going through this month-long uh, rehab program. Like, how is all this happening? It's not your strength. It's not my strength, right? And so it implies that there's somebody else who's ultimately directing and, and guiding our life. And unfortunately, she had a she didn't have a good experience uh, with religion as a, as a child. I think she was born Jewish. Um, but, the, but, but the point was she could recognize that, that there was something, someone greater in her life that was ultimately carrying her through these difficulties. And so it, to me, it was just, it was a beautiful encounter because it was just like, God just shows up all over the place. Like right. he's just, his, his presence is just always there. Even in this woman who wasn't, intentionally searching for God, who was really experiencing a lot of suffering, it was very clear that she was being held by him. Right. Yeah, you're right that, it, like, an awareness of, you know, you tell her there is an other, you know, there's some, you know, there's a personal forgiving, not obsessed with your past, he's love, he's, he's, you know, he's there for us, we belong to him kind of thing. And the most sane thing we could do, I guess this is what struck me, the most sane thing we could do is to open ourselves to this other. And I, it just resonated with me because it's like, yeah, we can get whatever challenges, struggles, start just focusing on that stuff. And if we can open ourselves up to God to believe he's really present to us, he's with us, then we can have some peace and some anxiety. And I'm sorry, go ahead. All right. Yeah, I think, you know, even as even as religious people who, you know, obviously we we believe in God, but we can we there can be a real tendency to turn God into a, almost like an object, you know, especially in our prayer. It's like, OK, I'm just going to say my prayers, you know, and we just run through them. But if we can just stop for a moment and realize, like, we are praying to not some abstract deity, but a, a personal God. Right, who right. is with us right now in the present moment, who is directing our lives, who's guiding us. Like, I think the awareness of that is so, so important, and it's such a, a beautiful experience of God. And you write about your own struggle when you were younger with anxiety and how an awareness of that presence. With Your mom was in depression and things, and, and you talked about how your prayer was kind of this anguish and crying out, but it... it became like this a deepening awareness of God's presence in your life, and that helped you. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, my mom, when I was about, actually when I was a senior in high school, so I was about 18, my mom uh, slipped into a depression because her, her mother had just passed away, and she, my mom never really recovered from that, from the loss of her mother. And so she slipped into this depression and basically, never she lived the rest of her life like that. And so, you know, as an 18-year-old man, I, I, I lost, I basically lost my mother that day. And so, it caused a lot of questions. It caused a, a lot of pain within me. Um, but the the miraculous thing was, it was in that crying out for another, where I really encountered uh, the presence of God. And you know, sometimes I say, like, I'm not sure if I would be a priest today. Uh, and a religious, were it not for that suffering, that God really, he really used that suffering to reveal himself to me. And so it was, yeah, it was, it was humbling and profound at the, at the same time. Right. You write about how, and it resonated again with me, how we want God just to, I forgot the phrase, but, you know, just to take away all the suffering. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you found this blessing I guess, through the suffering and a, a new discovery of him. Yeah, it was, it, yeah, it's, it's a strange experience. It's like, of course, you know, I wanted my mom to be healed and I wanted life to go on as I knew it. But God used that, you know, to bring about good, right? right. You know, St. Paul talks about in Romans how, you know, God works good for all of those who love him. Well, at the time, I didn't really know God, so I didn't really love him, but God was even working good in that, you know, and I think, you know, in our current culture and climate, even, even with COVID going on, so obviously on one level, it's, it's a huge tragedy, um, but God is still at work. And I'm hearing stories of, of people sharing how they're coming to know God, how they're 
deepening in their prayer life through this very difficulty that we're going through really as a, as a world right now. Right. And you, you write as well about how we can search our, and try to find our identity, you know, in other things or having, doing more. Uh, but we belong to God. You quoted St. Paul how about how we, how we belong to Him, you know, and that's where we mm -hmm. find our, and I, you know, it's like things, uh, things I've heard before, but when you write about them and put them in with a little story, <laughs> it really, <laughs> it really strikes it. Yeah, we forget these basic truths of our yeah. faith. He's in our life, we belong to Him, our identity is from Him, that He loves us. Yeah, I think one of the reasons why I wrote this book is because, you know, faith, Christianity is not abstract. Right? We believe that the, God became flesh, he entered time, and he entered space, and he entered history. And it's continuing in our history, in our lives. You know? And so that's why I wanted to use stories from, from real life that so people can relate to. You know, it says, oh yes, like God is at work, and here's, here's the proof. You know, I don't need, a, don't need a theology degree, or I don't need to be a cloistered nun to have an experience of God. Right? Right. I mean, the good news is nothing can keep God away from us. Right. You know, he loves us so much and he desires us so much. He's always speaking to us through through life, mostly. Right. And sometimes the suffering is, yeah, you, you're right that we think we need to try harder. We did something wrong. And yeah. maybe, you know, maybe it's just, hey, let's open ourselves up to the other, to God in our life in this. You know, it's not necessarily because yeah. even Mary, you're right. You know, Mary was troubled right at the announcement mm -hmm. of the angel, Archangel Gabriel. But yet she, talk about her, her approach, her contemplative approach to life. Yeah, um, I think what I love so much about uh, Our Lady is, you know, Our Lady is sort of put here at the center of salvation history, and she's not given a playbook, right? The angel doesn't say, okay, Mary, this is what it's going to look like. You know, your son's going to be handed over. He's going to be betrayed. Or you're going to lose him in the temple. And so Mary has to live her whole life in faith, right, and in trust and in surrender, ultimately to the, to the goodness of God. And as these events, as her life is unfolding on a natural level, they must have been confusing to her. You know, she says when she loses Jesus in the temple, son, did you not know we were looking for you? You know, any mother would ask that question, but yet Mary, her foundation is trust. Her foundation is surrender. And so I think that's, to me, that's always the difference between Our Lady and at least me, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to giving in to uh, God is not here or God is absent or I did something wrong. Mary's like, Mary's, her posture is more like, I can't understand fully, but I believe mm -hmm. and I trust. Mm -hmm. Well, that's yeah. great words to end on. I, I, this has gone way too fast. <laughs> we'll have to have you back <laughs> sometime. But uh, Father Jeremiah, thank you. thank you so much for talking with us. Thanks, Father. God bless you. Well, I love Father Jeremiah's book. And one of the great themes in there, and it's our challenge for you this week, is to live in the present moment. It's there that we find God, it's there that we can surrender to Him, that we can receive from Him, that we can pray to mm -hmm. Him, and, and live a sane way in the challenges <laughs> of this modern world we find ourselves in. And I like how he points out that we do live in a busy and noisy world, and I think there's just so many distractions uh, that we encounter every day, daily life, in school, doesn't matter. It happens in religion too. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but I think that's something to really kind of touch upon these days, is that just to pull away from all that and just give a little bit of time to to God, you know. And it's like if you can go on a retreat, that's great. If you can make an hour, an holy hour, that's great. But sometimes just that five minutes, right. just to stop what you're doing and just kind of re recollect yourself to God, goes a long way. And I I loved his simple point about living in the present moment, just to focus. Mm -hmm on what you're doing now, yeah. what's going on around you, paying attention to the people around you, listening to them, because it's there that we find yeah. God. I think that is a big thing today, is learning how to listen. You know, and I think today, you know, we live in a world of hurt, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of injustices out there, but just to listen to our neighbor, you know, and that's an act of love every time we do that, just to listen to, and you know, most of the time I've found that people really do open up the more you're 
you know, they're not looking so much just to be preached at, but sometimes just to be listened to. So. Right. And I, I thought this, this book really fit our theme of evangelization on Life on the Rock, just because, you know, if you're listening to this and you don't have a real practicing faith life, you mm -hmm. haven't been to church, you know, he writes beautifully about just trusting in God, recognizing him as the other, that there's something bigger than ourselves that's controlling our life and leading us and guiding us and that he's present to us. So if we could slow down and listen, and we could find God in that present moment, mm. which we live every day yeah. through the normal everyday things of life, and take that to prayer, you know, and listen in prayer as well. Yeah, that's an important mm. aspect, because God is looking for a relationship with us. And there's a hunger in us to have that relationship with God. And there's ways to really cultivate that. So, right. so we'll send you to that vineyard with that challenge to live in the present moment. May our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you. May He give you His peace. May He fill you with His Spirit and help you to find Him in an ever deeper way. May God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week on Life on the Rock. Yeah.